The Arnold Clark Reel Sale is now on. Welcome to Peter and Ruffy's Football Show on PLZ Soccer's YouTube channel. I'm Peter Martin, delighted to have your company on this Tuesday, getting ready for the weekend Scottish Cup action and lots to talk about in the company of Alan Ruff as ever alongside me and Hugh McDonald of the Daily Mail. Delighted to have him back. Must have been an important meeting today and then Hugh decided to come to the studio afterwards. That is the smartest I have seen him on the show, Ruffy. Yeah, I have to say designer stuff, you know, as you would expect from a man of his calibre. Yep, absolutely. Man. Here's a man who's taking checks in from every media company across the globe, which is why he can afford the suit in the first place. Here's what we're going to have a chat about. Yeah, lots happening across football, of course. Uh, the month of January is always intense for football fans because unlike the old days, uh, Hugh, uh, you've got one month where players are leaving and there's the prospect of some tasty players coming in. Now, uh, I think Celtic fans will be looking and thinking to themselves, Olivier and Cham, would you sell them for 14 million? Absolutely sell them for 14 million. I think apart from anything else, I mean, there's so many good reasons to sell them, but I think to... Two of the main reasons are A, you're uh, Celtic are covered in that position, they've got midfield options, and B, it's certainly just my view, but I, I think since Encham wasn't allowed to leave in the summer, he's hardly, you know, he's, he's hardly been outstanding since. Uh, so I don't know if he's uh, suffering from the the psychic of, uh, injury, not a groin stain, but a petted lip, you know, or a slightly petted lip. But I would certainly let him go for uh, for 14 mil. Particularly, as there's, as there's a rumour that part of the deal would be to bring a defender to Celtic part. And as I've said all along with Celtic, what Celtic really need in this, tra this transfer window is a right fullback. Yeah, I mean, I'm slightly gobsmacked by the whole uh, thing. I can see certain aspects mm. of their strategy which are all too apparent in every transfer window, Ruffy, which is basically bring on, uh, you know, one for the future, um, somebody who's got a goal-scoring pedigree in a lesser country, and then over and above that, you know, the tease of a big-name signing, but then nothing materialises and somebody else goes out the door. If it was me, I'd, I'd bank the money for, for Encham, mm -hmm. Um, but the big question here is Yaya Touré didn't distance himself last night on Sky Sports from the possibility of maybe having a final year in Scotland. Yeah, yeah I listened to that interview myself and I think it all depends on his uh, relationship uh, you know, with the Touré that's there. I think he'll obviously be on the phone, they'll be chatting, he'll be asking him you know, what kind of place is it, what kind of club is it, you know, and he'll be telling him about European football, the likes. And then he'll have to assess whether he wants to be. When I listened to him, he was I don't think he was too convinced about going back to the English Premiership. I, I got the feeling he'd done done it. You know, I, I want to move on and do something else. So yeah. I think they might have a chance. As far as Cham's concerned, they've done, you know, what they said they're going to do, buy somebody cheap and sell them on, and he comes into that category. And it's another massive financial bonus. But and it's I, I don't think the supporters would be up in arms about him leaving. Mm. I don't think he's established himself as a big, big hero with the supporters, so I don't think he'd be sadly missed. Yeah, if you're looking at the way they've conducted themselves, both sides, obviously they're neck and neck <coughs> at the top. Suddenly everybody believes that there is a title race on. If anything, the upper hand as far as getting players in to get the fans excited is firmly at Ibrox. Yeah, because they've made two very high profile. They've, they've brought back um, uh, an old hero in Stephen Davis into a position where they are sought as you know a number 10 position. They really had to address that. Uh, and, and Jermaine Defoe, uh, who uh, you know, has scored, you know, he's an England international and scored goals at in every every level he's paid it. To go back to the Encham thing, I think Encham's a smashing player. He plays for France under 21s. He's a great, he's, I think he's a smashing player. My point is, though, if you're getting 14 million for a player who's not over the moon where he is at the moment and he's going to move on anyway and you have, you know, five or six midfielders already, 
great. But again, without you know breaking the old broken, they've got to get a right fullback. Yeah, well, well, well a right fullback. Uh, you know, I, I, I've, I've mentioned uh, again uh, on last night's show, a right fullback, a centre half uh, wouldn't uh, go amiss, no. um, and I'd let I, I would let Boyata go. Mm -hmm. um, uh, and I still think a Yaya Touri style player mm -hmm. um, would transform McGregor and Christie in the middle of the park as well. I mean. Uh, I think the Celtic fans are still to be excited by anything. I don't think they're excited too much at the moment by Oliver Burke. Um, yeah. They're looking at Vaku and Isuf Bayou and thinking, OK. Could be anything. Yeah, and Timothy Weir, you know, that's like, mm. my dad was great. Mm. We don't necessarily know if your son was great um, or is great. Um, but uh, at the end of the day, the other key element here is however many players they sign, how many of them are going to start, Hugh? Exactly. I mean, that's what you 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 really have to see. What you're looking at the transfer window to do is to, in, in my view, especially when you've got a war chest that Celtic have, and it is considerable, is you've got to say, how do I prove, we're not talking about how do you prove the depth of the squad, how do you improve your first 11? And again, the way you improve your first 11, I would suggest to buy a bona fide striker at the moment because you've got to have backup. And again, again, without belabouring the point, which I'm belabouring, you've got to buy a right back. I mean, you've got to, these are things that that your first team address the deficiencies in your first 11. Yeah, of course, there's all sorts of gossip <coughs> around. Our man Gabriel Antoniazzi has been looking at some of the suggestions for in and out. Rangers are reportedly set to sign Charlton striker Carlin Ahern Grant on a pre-contract deal ahead of a summer move. The forward looks set to leave the League One side this summer and he could be lined up as a possible replacement for Alfredo Morelos if he leaves. Charlton turned down a £500,000 bid for the striker earlier this month. Ex-Manchester City midfielder Yaya Toure is rumoured to be linking up with brother Colo at Celtic. The 35-year-old didn't close the door on a move to the Scottish champions during an appearance on Sky Sports last night. He revealed he would have to speak to Brendan Rodgers when questioned about a possible switch to Scotland. Porto could test Celtic's resolve with a reported £40 million bid for midfielder Olivier Chan. The Portuguese side failed to land the former Manchester City player in the summer, but it's been reported they are set to make a fresh bid. The deal could include former Newcastle defender Chancel Mbemba. Aberdeen winger Gary Mackay Stephen has been attracting interest from across the pond, with MLS side New York City FC declaring an interest. Don's boss Derek McInnes insists the winger hasn't indicated he'll be leaving Pataudry, but with two weeks to go until the end of the transfer window and his contract running out in the summer, the Scotland star could yet opt to sign a deal with the US side. Yeah, Gary Mackay, Stephen, he's in a good place uh, at the moment, Ruffy, because I, I thought he was looking good up until he picked up, uh, you know, that really bad injury. Yeah, and he got the introduction to the Scotland squad, which would have been a boost for him as well, but... It just seems to be that the Scottish clubs are not offering these players enough money. There's too many temptations elsewhere. America is up and running. You know, we see a lot of players, you know, just enthusiastic about what Evans happening over there. It's a family uh, place to go and the money is right and it's probably better than what Aberdeen are going to offer them. So the Scottish clubs have now got a problem because the best players are going to look abroad and see where they're going to go. Yeah, well, if anything, they had that problem many years ago. <clears throat> Prudence is always the key now if, if anybody wants to learn the lessons of what went wrong before. Absolutely, and, and, and now people are, are really tied to tight budgets. And, you know, I've had conversations with some uh, managers this week about budgets, and I think we'd all be amazed at how tight some of the budgets are. I mean, Mr Ruff will know that, being a, a director at, at Partick Thistle, that, that you know, it, it, Scottish football is tight for money now. And the other thing about the USA, at one time USA was thought to be, you know, the burial ground for footballing careers. You went out there to top up the pension fund. That's not the case now. You know, players are going out there to make a, you know, in early stages and forge a career and what's a decent league. And as Alan correctly pointed out, a smashing lifestyle and there'll be more money there than there will be in the Scottish Premiership. Yeah, uh, absolutely. Of course, uh, saving money seems to be the key. Yes. Celtic and Rangers have announced uh, a couple of former players in prominent roles in their youth development uh, and uh, at Rangers. Uh, Kevin Thompson gets the under-18s job. Uh, congratulations to him. Steve McManus was um, unveiled today as the under-18 coach at Celtic and uh, his main priority is to try and unearth another star for the first team. Brendan, the manager and the, and the coaching staff 
the first team level, they'll, they'll be the ones that will make the, uh, the decisions up. Like I say, my job here is going to be to focus on the on the under 18s as such to, to help produce some players for, for the first team. That's what I'm going to do, and that's what I'm going to work as hard as I possibly can to do. If you can produce young players that are going to save the club millions of pounds, then great. And that's what I'm going to focus on. Yep, um, that is the key. And and to be fair, I think uh, you know there are a number of clubs who have a good reputation of getting players through. Celtic, to their credit, have have had a, a good three or four that have managed to well, actually they, get uh, themselves in. Yep. And now at this point in time, Celtic have got you know millions of pounds worth of talent that's come through McGregor. Now I would, I think I would agree that Callum McGregor now is a, a, an English Premier League player. James Forrest has been linked with a big move, as we know, to Liverpool. How uh, um, uh, Kieran Tierney was uh, will be, you know, he, he'll he'll be, he'll command a massive fee if and when he goes. Yeah. Uh, Ralston now is coming into the side. So, yep, uh, there's a few there that, that, uh, that will earn Celtic money in England. And Mikey Johnson as well. The, the, the reports from him, uh, I've only glimpsed him in the first team, but everybody thinks he could be top class as well. Yeah, and, and, and let's not forget, when you talk about some of the other clubs, I think Hearts deserve special yep. mention. They've managed to get mm -hmm. uh, young players through. Harry Cochran, yes, uh, Smith, certainly McDonald's. in there. Yep. Uh, Brandon as well. I would, I would throw Motherwell into that bracket mm -hmm. as well. I think Motherwell yeah. have done particularly well over the last well, three or four years with the right coaches behind the scenes, and they've all broke into the first team or moved on. Yeah, yep. absolutely. And, and of course, uh, you know, <coughs> uh, interestingly enough, we were talking about yesterday, some of the key players that are coming back to your game. Ross McCormack yeah, could be an interesting one. Uh, yeah. If only for the fact that I, I look at the signings that are being made in the bottom half of the table, mm. you know, from six downwards uh, to 12, mm. or from seven downwards, I beg your pardon, to 12, you're thinking to yourself, you have to sign someone that can make a, a significant con contribution in, if it's not scoring the goals, it's creating them. I think he'll score goals. I think you're, you're bang on there. I think what, when when you get below, when you get up, uh, to a certain level in the football, I think a lot of the teams at the bottom are much of a muchness. And the big problem is the final third. The big problem is the final third. And if you can get somebody that can score and or create in the final third, you're on plums. I mean, is there much difference between Motherwell now than Motherwell with Louis Moult? No, except mm -hmm. that incredible goal tally. Yeah. I mean, the rest of the team will be pretty much a muchness. Yeah. Main's One, been good. Main's been good, but he's yeah. not been Louis Moult. No. And, and if you've got that, if you strike it really lucky with a good striker, suddenly you're in two cup finals, you're in the top six, everyone's happy. Yeah. Because there's not much of a difference and it, it is at the top end mm -hmm. that it matters. And Livingston seem to have nailed their colours to the mast. They want people down the flanks trying to create uh, for their strikers. Mm -hmm. um, you know, Greg Wilde's in there and suddenly Chris Erskine mm -hmm. signs up at Livingston. Yes, both, two both forward-minded players. They like to get on the ball, they like to go and attack mm -hmm. teams, you know, go by people. That's what the supporters want to see. And then certainly it takes away if everybody's saying, oh, Livingston are just a hard team. Mm. They're certainly now adding a, a different dimension to their, their team. Yep. OK, you can give us your thoughts on Twitter <coughs> at PLZ Soccer and you can also give us your thoughts on facebook.com forward slash PLZ Soccer and, of course, on the YouTube channel. Don't forget to like, share and follow. You can subscribe uh, on our YouTube channel as well throughout the course of 2018-2019 season. Uh, there's lots to talk about as well. If you download the app, uh, you can record uh, your message on Video Reporter and we can feature it here on the show. You never know you might pick up yourself uh, the odd prize here and there. Uh, so with that in mind, um, there's lots of other things to talk about. One of them was the uh, wild gossip about possibly the two Dundee sides merging. Mm. You get two sets of American owners. It's great. It's like, you know, uh, you meet somebody in New York and they say, oh, I used to live in Scotland. Do you know wee Mac who, uh. who comes from a certain area? Mm. Uh, the two Americans are so far apart, they've mm. denied mm. that there's any possibility of a merger between Dundee United and Dundee. I don't think it, I don't think it would be financially viable at all. You know because we saw it years ago. We were old enough to see it with the the Hearts Hub scenario. It just doesn't work. You know, people say if you get five and five, it makes ten. But these mergers sometimes when you get five and five, it makes six or something. You know, you don't automatically get. So I don't think what is on is. Are you what saying I, Dundee City won't work? No, I don't think it works. What might work and and, and what I would be interested in is if they, they if they got one stadium. That would then uh, 
you know, would then really drastically reduce the costs of, of both sides. Uh, they could put in a, a really, you know, a, a purpose-built stadium. Could they sell off the land? Blah, de, blah, de, blah. I could yeah. see that working, but I don't see a Dundee City working, no. I, I, I like what you're saying, because, <laughs> you know, I know a lot of people from mm. Dundee and, you know, the so thoughts of a merger is just, I no. think, ignorance from people out with exactly. who think that they, they, they could easily come together as, as a City team. The one thing that I do think it makes perfect sense and could be very lucrative, it works in Milan, mm. you know, share the stadium, one half's blue, the other's mm. tangerine, you, you enter by two different mm. doors, perfect, because you're, you're training elsewhere anyway. Mm -hmm. Yeah, now that's the modern day now, I mean, players don't report uh, to the stadium on ma till match day, and uh, that would be the scenario, and I think it's because the two stadiums are so close together, you know, you would think in the planning mm -hmm. concept you could have you know, not just a stadium, but you could have a whole massive complex yeah. around the two stadiums. You could open up to the community. You could do loads of things with it. Hotels, malls. Yeah, you could have you could everything. And I, I'm, I'm like you, supporters have already stated, you know, it's just not going to happen. And I don't think it will either. Yeah. Um, OK, you can give us your view <coughs> on sharing a stadium. Uh, Dundee fans, would you buy into that? Um, as far as Dundee are concerned, how unlucky can you get, you, you know, they get Andrew Davis in and, <clears throat> and he breaks his ankle uh, in training. I mean, that is a real body blow for Jim McIntyre. Yeah, and, and you can see the way that Jim's thinking. You know, Jim's obviously had time to sit down and, 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 and through this transfer window, clear people out that he doesn't want, free up. And he's almost gone down what they tried and trusted way, what worked at Ross County. When Ross County were in trouble, what worked there? Yeah. And he's went back. He's Ross went County back to players, <laughs> and he's knows. And and, yep. and, and, uh, and this one, I think Andrew Davis would have been pretty central to his plans, not just for his playing ability, but his ability in addressing him, his leadership. So yeah, big blow. Uh, OK, uh, just before we finish, maybe we'll talk about a man who used to uh, manage here in Scottish football, certainly transformed it over a period of time with multi-million pound signings. He's uh, worked his magic at a few clubs along the way. He's given the Irish fans something to remember. Um, certainly not at the tail end of it, but uh, Martin O'Neill now suddenly finds himself back in club management at the... Uh, at the stadium and the club where he won some fantastic honours, the Premier League title or the old First Division, as mm. it was known, and the European Cup as well. He's returning to Nottingham Forest as the boss. I think, from <clears> a <throat> personal point of view, he can really revive mm. uh, that old giant. Well, he's going to have the respect uh, of any manager that's went there. You know, they're in a stable position. Uh, I don't think they're, they're fighting relegation. They're very healthy. The fans will get right behind him. I'm, I'm really waiting to see if Roy Keane <laughs> is going to get a shout there to join him as well, because uh, they've been working together. But on the whole, you know, we know the way Martin operates, and he always usually gets a success wherever he goes. And uh, I'm sure that's what Notts Forest will be looking for. Yep. Um, I think if he gets the financial backing, Hugh, that's the key for me, because then he can start to work his magic in the, the individual man management. I'm sure there's going to be a team of four and five that he brings along as well, well as Keane. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, <laughs> I think the, the big problem is that it is that the Notts Forest has been a club in some turbulence for a, for a few years. And... You just wonder what the backroom stuff is all about and what's going on there. Martin, unashamedly, Martin would be a man to buy success. You know, and I don't, I don't say that as, as, as slaughtering him. That's what he does. He, he knows the imperatives of football. He knows what he wants and goes out and gets it. He's not a man that's, uh, that, that, that will spend all day in a training ground. That's why he's got Steve Wal Walford and... I wonder if John Robertson will come along and do a wee bit of part-time work there because... It would make perfect wouldn't, sense. Wouldn't it? But, but, I mean, I know Rob was very happy in retirement, but I wonder if he would shove a day or two in just going along the road, uh, Keane as well. Yep, yeah, it, it's got all ingredients to work, but I think significantly I would really have to be sure of what's behind the scenes at Not For, Not's For Us, and I'm not that sure about that. Yeah, it'll be interesting because, you know, uh, the likes of Steve Guppy was part of his backroom yeah. team, um, Roy Keane, mm. he always likes to take Steve Walford for them. Walford will go, yeah. yeah uh, and, and as you mentioned there, Robbo as mm. well. It'll be, uh, you know, if you are a Nottingham Forest fan, the nostalgia around oh. it all will be fantastic. Season ticket sales mm. through the roof, and then, as you say, the key to it all is the money. 
personally, you know, uh, you know, because of my experiences with him it's, uh, uh, as a Celtic manager, I hope he does have the uh, one or two annoying journalists down there that can uh, annoy the life out of him. Uh, <laughs> and he, he's got he's got history in Notts Forest as a player when he, uh, he used to answer. I uh, used to answer, uh, you know, uh, phone calls and letters in the paper, the local paper, at the end of the season. You know, he used to write to people and that. He's a very, as you know, Peter, very spiky, almost eccentric character, but a very, a hugely engaging one. And, and, and he knows what he wants out of his football teams. And his success, I mean, all... all Football careers, managerial careers, always end in a bit of failure. That's why there's the, the merry-go-round. Yeah. But what he did at Ireland initially was fantastic. Yeah. And to be fair to him, by the way, what he did at Celtic oh. will never be forgotten by the Celtic oh. fans. I mean, uh, Celtic have posted, a, a, you know, best of luck to Martin mm. at Nottingham Forest uh, on their website. Um, and I think a lot of Celtic fans hold Martin in high oh. regard for, for the yeah, achievements. Well, uh, uh, Hugh touched on it briefly. He did spend... You know, and he went out and brought the right players in at the mm -hmm. right money, and he got the success with it. You know, and that's why the Celtic supporters will remember what he's done. He's got a great record as well. For see, when he spends big, he gets it right, and the reason he gets it right is he knows what he wants. He's either, you know, he knows he wants two big centre forwards, for example. So you got Sutton and Hartson. Yeah. He knows what he wants in midfield: a tidy player, Lennon, a powerful player. Yeah. So I mean, he knows. That, what he wants for that template. Yeah, always helps if he inherits a world-class player uh, to boot. Um, but <clears throat> that's yeah. another story. You know the drill. Um, anyway, best of luck to Martin O'Neill at uh, Nottingham Forest. Um, we'll be back tomorrow night. Uh, Barry Ferguson uh, will be with us. He'll be talking uh, about the latest speculation on all the transfers, possibly. We'll have another story or two from Celtic Rangers and the other clubs, Hearts and Hibs as well, coming up on the programme. Join us if you can. Six o'clock, Peter and Ruffy's Football Show on YouTube. The Arnold Clark Real Sale is now on.